morning. I'm Fia Fassbinder. I'm an executive speaker coach and founder of the Moxie Institute. And the Moxie Institute helps executives and organizations, Fortune 500 companies, and TEDx speakers step on stage to deliver their message with confidence, clarity, and credibility. And I'm here today to talk to you about the Moxie method of effective communication. Before we get started with the keynote, I am going to do a brief warm-up exercise that I do with my clients pre-presentation, and I'm going to ask you to do it with me. So can I have everybody stand? Now this is called a shakedown, and we do this pre-presentation, and I'll explain why afterwards. So we are going to shake our right hand and count from five to one, and then our left hand while we're counting from five to one, then our right foot, and then our left foot. And I want to hear nice, loud voices and really shake to wake up your body. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. 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 Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. I can't hear you. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. 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 Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 one. Excellent. <laughs> Have a seat. Thank you for indulging me in that warm up exercise. I ask my clients to do this warm up exercise as a way to relieve nerves before a presentation. It also helps to wake us up, especially when it's this early in the morning that we're presenting. And FYI, studies have shown that asking your audience to engage in an experiential activity within the first two minutes of a presentation increases engagement by up to 50%. How many people get nervous when they present? It's okay to admit it here. How many people are terrified? Okay. I want to let you know that you are not alone. In theater, which is my background, we have a saying, and that saying is, if you're not nervous, you're dead. <laughs> Meaning everybody that's alive and breathing to some degree suffers from stage fright. Mark Twain had a great quote. He said, there are two types of speakers, those that are nervous and those that are liars. <laughs> There's a word for public speaking fear, and the word comes from the Greek language, and it's glossophobia, which means fear or dread of the tongue. And in the last census study, we discovered that 74% of the population has a fear of speaking in public. 74% of the population, that's, look around, that's 7 out of 10 of you. It's a little higher in women than men, but it's a, a really high number. So this means it's a common and very normal fear. This is what we also learned in that census study, that more people are afraid of speaking in public than of dying. More people are afraid of speaking in public than of dying. Jerry Seinfeld had a really funny joke that at a funeral, more people would rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy. <laughs> Biologically speaking, this fear makes a lot of sense. Historically, Four things were very bad for our survival and meant we would probably be attacked and eaten. These are the four things. Standing alone, with no weapons, with no place to hide, and a large group of creatures staring at you. <laughs> Sounds a little familiar, huh? Like public speaking? So what scientists have discovered is that this fear is actually our fight or flight that takes over, and it's about 60,000 years old. It lives in the most reptilian part of our brain, the amygdala, and it fires off whenever we feel like we might be attacked and eaten. So on top of that, what happens when our fight or flight kicks in is that adrenaline rushes through our body. It cuts off our frontal cortex. Now our frontal cortex is responsible for problem solving, thinking on our feet, and ability to have logic, which is all very necessary when you speak in public. There are some benefits to stage fright, however. It isn't all bad. Stage fright reminds our body that it's game time. 
It gives us the energy we need to present. It goes back to that quote, if you're not nervous, you're dead. Meaning, if we didn't have any adrenaline coursing through our body, our presentations would be lifeless. We've all sat through those presentations that you wish the speaker was a little nervous. The other thing that happens is that we can channel, if we can learn how to channel that nervous energy into usable energy and channel that fear into focus, we can give an effective presentation. But how do we do that? That's really the question. Edward R. Murrow, the famous journalist, had this quote, and I love this quote. The best speakers know enough to be scared. The only difference between the pros and the novices is that the pros have trained the butterflies to fly in formation. So our job as public speakers is really to recognize that those butterflies in our stomach will always be there, but that we can train them to fly in formation. So how do we do that? I've created the MOXIE method of effective public speaking to teach people how to effectively speak in public. The MOXIE method was born out of my time in New York City. I was an actor in New York City for over a decade, and I loved to perform, but I had debilitating stage fright to the point that I wasn't sleeping at night before, I would throw up in the bathrooms backstage, and I had to find tools and techniques to help myself overcome that fear of public speaking because I loved it so much. I came back to San Diego and I got my teaching credential, and I realized as I was teaching at UCSD that it wasn't just actors that suffered from stage fright, that people in the community and business people needed these tools to help them as well. And I always say that public speaking is any time you're not speaking to yourself. So the MOXIE method of effective public speaking really has a lot of uses and a lot of widespreading uses in your lives. Now the MOXIE method is very hands-on. It's an experiential method. And I compare it to riding a bike. We don't learn to ride a bike by connecting with people on LinkedIn that have ridden bikes, or watching TED Talks about riding bikes, or listening to podcasts about riding bikes. We learn to ride a bike by riding a bike. We fall off, we scrape our knees, we learn to balance, we learn to break. Well, public speaking is exactly the same. We will never learn how to do it by reading about it or watching other people do it. We have to do it ourselves and experience what it feels like. So I'm saying this partially as a warning, and partially because I'm going to put you through some experiential activities today that will help you learn how to effectively speak in public. So why the word moxie before we go into the method? Well, this is the formal definition of the word moxie. Most of you know it from the gangster movies in the 1930s or maybe even the old soda drink. The informal definition of moxie is swagger. I like the word because it really embodies how I want my clients to step on stage. Dale Carnegie used to say, talk to them like they owe you money. This is moxie. <laughs> so the moxie method is also, moxie is also an acronym for the five fundamentals of effective public speaking, and each letter stands for a different fundamental. So let's get started. The M of moxie is for move your mouth or enunciating. Now in everyday lives, most of us speak with pretty small, lazy mouths. There's not a need to really open our mouths to enunciate. Actors learn to enunciate because it's important to be heard and understood by thousands of people in the audience. It's this important for us too. Here's why. Not only can we be heard and understood better when we open our mouths, but we appear much more professional, confident, and trustworthy. Studies have shown that people that speak with small mouths are actually distrusted. That unconsciously, we think if you open your mouth, you have nothing to hide. So the ability to enunciate and learning the techniques of actors to enunciate can really serve us in our public speaking. And we're going to try a little bit of it now. I'm going to ask you <laughs> to try this theater tongue twister with me. The tongue twister is, my mouth makes many mobile movements. Now we're going to say it three times. And while you're doing this, I want you to let your mouth make many mobile movements. Really stretch much bigger than you're used to. Okay, here we go. 
Go. My mouth makes many mobile movements. Great. Two more times. My mouth makes many mobile movements. One more time. My mouth makes many mobile movements. Excellent. I saw a lot of great open mouths. Now, this might feel strange at first, but it actually looks so much better. You appear confident and you appear professional and you're definitely understood. Well, I work with my clients to learn what is called the Yale School of Drama Vocal Warm-Up. The Yale School of Drama, how many people have heard of Yale? So the Yale School of Drama is the most prestigious acting school in the United States, one of the most in the world. And their actors go through a rigorous training program to learn how to do Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, if you've ever seen a Shakespearean play, is kind of like acrobatics for our mouth. It's really difficult to say. So their mouths have to be highly trained. And this warm-up is almost like going to the gym for our mouth. It's a stretching and strengthening warm-up so that those actors can say any lines of Shakespeare without fumbling over their words. And we can use this warm-up as well. Now, we're not going to learn the whole thing today. We only have 40 minutes. But we're going to give a taste of the Yale School of Drama vocal warm-up. So first, we're going to try what's called lion mouse. We're going to stretch our mouths like lions yawning in the sun. And we're going to look really ridiculous, but it works. We're going to stretch our mouths, and we're going to stick our tongues out like this. And then we're going to say, when I say mouse, you're going to scrunch your face into a teeny tiny mouse, OK? This is a stretching exercise to help us open our mouths. Here we go, lion. Let me see some big lions yawning. Good. Mouse. Scrunch. Lion. Mouse. Lion. Mouse. Excellent. Good. Now we're going to strengthen our mouths a little. We're going to try a tongue twister. The tongue twister is Unique New York. Now, if you open your mouth big enough, you probably won't fumble over this tongue twister. And we're going to say it five times. Here we go. Unique New York. 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 Excellent. Excellent. Congratulations. You've just experienced the Yale School of Drama vocal warm-up. <laughs> the actual warm-up is about an hour. So when I work with clients individually, I teach them this entire warm-up, and they customize it so that they have a warm-up they can do before they present. But the entire warm-up is based on the ability to stretch and strengthen our vocal instrument. The O of MOXIE stands for oxygenate. So what does it mean to oxygenate? What it means to oxygenate is to breathe from our diaphragms. Now, your diaphragm is a sheath of connective muscle that sits between your chest and your abdomen. And its whole job is to get more air capacity into your body and into your lungs. In everyday life, our diaphragms are in a vegetative state. We don't really need them. Athletes use them to get more air so they can run faster, jump higher, perform better. Opera singers and pop singers use it so they can belt out those high notes. Yoga instructors use it so that they can breathe and ground themselves. And presenters need it as well. So what are the benefits of diaphragmatic breathing? When we learn to breathe from our diaphragm, we are much louder. Actually, volume in our voice does not come from pushing from here. It comes from air coming out. And when we learn to breathe from our diaphragm, we eliminate all kinds of vocal problems. How many people get sore throats when they talk a lot? That's most likely because you're pushing from here and you're not breathing from your diaphragm. The other amazing benefits of diaphragmatic breathing are our voices become richer, more resonant, deeper, both for men and women, and they stop quivering. So if you get nervous and your voice quivers when you speak, breathing from your diaphragm stops that dead in its tracks. On an emotional and psychological level, breathing from our diaphragm floods our bodies with oxygen and lowers our heart rate. So it really helps to control speech anxiety. In fact, yoga teachers call this kind of breathing tortoise breathing because it's grounded and calming. So we're going to try a diaphragmatic breathing exercise together. I'm going to ask you to sit straight in your chair so that your diaphragm isn't scrunched. And close your eyes for a second and put your hand on your belly. And I want you to imagine that you have a red balloon inside your belly. And every time you breathe in, that balloon inflates and fills up with air. And every time you breathe out, all that air leaves your balloon and comes out your mouth. And I want you just to take a couple deep breaths in and out and see if you can find the place on your belly that's rising and falling. 
That's your diaphragm. It should be somewhere right under your rib cage. Just take a couple breaths in and out and let your balloon fill up and deflate. Good. Good. Okay. Now everyone open your eyes again. And we're going to say this sentence. But we're going to say it in pieces and we're going to try to do it while we're breathing from our diaphragms. And I'm going to ask you to stand again. I warned you. I warned you there was going to be a lot of hands-on activities. So look at a wall. Everyone look at a wall. I don't care if it's the wall behind you, to the side of you, look at a wall. And you're going to take a deep breath in. And you're going to say, hey. And I want you to let out all your air and see if you can make your voice bounce off that wall. Try it. Breathe in. Hey. hey. Good. Now try it again. Take a deep breath in. And I want to hear, hey, you. Hey, you. Excellent. Now again, one more deep breath in. And then, hey, you hey, over you. there. Hey, you. Good. Now the whole sentence, hey, you over there, get off of my cloud. Go. Hey, hey you over there, get off of my cloud. Excellent. Have a seat. So that voice might have sounded strange to you because you're not used to incorporating that much breath into your voice, but that is actually what we call your real voice. And that is the way we should be speaking when we speak in public. You can hear the richness and the resonance and the power in that kind of voice. And we can actually speak for hours when we breathe from our diaphragm without any kind of vocal problems and usually without any mics. So let's go on to the X of Moxie, which is excite your audience, which I also call the science of not boring people. <laughs> so how do we excite our audience? How do we convey our message with passion? How do we ignite and persuade and influence and convert an audience that goes far beyond our words? One of the greatest ways we can do this is to use theatrical techniques. Now, actors have been studying for hundreds of years the best ways to excite an audience. And they talk about their actor's instrument. And you have two things as an actor to convey your character, two things that make up your instrument, your body and your voice. That's it. So we can use the techniques of actors and learn to hone our instrument to really excite our audience. No, some people are very naturally dramatic, and other people need some tools, and they need to think about what would be the best way to excite their audience. But before we go into those techniques, I want to address a misconception. And that misconception is that by using theatrical techniques, we're going to somehow become these overzealous, weird, cheesy, sweaty presenters that are all cookie cutters of each other because they've learned this strange moxie method. That would never be the goal. Now, I'm a method actor, and I study method acting, which is from Stanislavski. And Stanislavski said that the best acting is you, only you at your most expressive. And this is the same with public speaking. The best public speakers are themselves, only themselves at their most expressive. So through this training, you can develop what I like to call your own unique speaker persona. And your speaker persona is you. It is authentic to you. It's just you at your most confident, eloquent, and well-spoken. So let's learn some of these techniques. In order to excite our audience, we can use vocal variety, which is how we use our voices, nonverbal communication, which is how we use our bodies, and eye contact. We're going to work on vocal variety. Now, we have five techniques with vocal variety, and I actually encourage my clients to go through their scripts with me and mark places where they might use some of these techniques. We don't wing it. We don't leave it till the last minute. We actually really put a lot of thought into which vocal variety techniques would be best to engage an audience. Those techniques are emphasis, which is which words we choose to stress, pitch, which is how high or low our voices go, Volume, which is the loud, loud or soft. Tempo, which is how fast or slow we speak. And phrasing, which is where we choose to pause. Now, I know these are a lot of techniques. And just because we have 40 minutes, I'm going to work on one of those techniques. We are going to work on emphasis. Now, emphasis can be a really powerful tool if we need to stress words that we want to drive home to our audience. 
So we're going to try this sentence. And the sentence is, I can't tell you not to go. But every time we say the sentence, we are going to emphasize. Let's say the sentence, and I want you to stress the word I first. Go. I Good. Now do it again and stress the word can't. I can't. Good. Do it again and stress the word you. Again and stress the word not. Good. Now stress the word to. Now stress the word go. Excellent. Do you see how it changed the meaning of the sentence just by emphasizing different words? So emphasis is a very powerful tool that we have at our disposal for effective public speaking. I want to quote a couple studies that I think really drive home the point about vocal variety. Duke Business School did a major study that they just published in Psychology Today, and they studied 500 CEOs of majorly held firms in the United States. And all they studied was vocal variety. In fact, all they studied was pitch, which is how high or low your voice is. And what they found was pretty amazing. What they found was for every 25% decrease in vocal pitch, meaning lower voices, those CEOs made up to $500,000 a year more stayed in, in the positions up to six months longer and managed larger firms just by lowering their voices. And the reasoning, they think, is that unconsciously we associate deeper voices with powerful leaders. Unconsciously, we think, well, that person has a deep voice, therefore they must have lots of testosterone, therefore they can attack us from, they can save us from attack by a saber-toothed tiger. Now, this doesn't mean that we want women to sound like they have a lot of testosterone with deeper voices. But it does mean that deeper voices and the ability to breathe from our diaphragm and have a nice, rich, resonant, deep voice is associated with effective leadership. So that by training our voices to have vocal variety, we can really become more powerful leaders. The other study was published in the Harvard Business Review, and they were talking to business recruiters, business management recruiters for the MBA programs. And they asked them, what is the hands down top thing you look for in a candidate? The thing that's the deal breaker, that if they don't have this, they will not make it into your program. And across the board, those MBA recruiters said that was verbal communication skills. That what they found is that good leaders are not good leaders for their ability to email or text. They're good leaders for their ability to persuade and inspire with their words. So that if these MBA candidates could not pass the interview, no matter what their credentials were, they were not considered to get into the program. So we're going to go on to nonverbal communication. And I talk about the tip of the iceberg with nonverbal communication because what we say is really the tip of the iceberg and how we say it with our bodies is everything underneath. We have three ways we can really influence our, with our bodies. And the first is to command the space. Actors call this taking the stage. Most of us, when we present, we get nervous. We want to hide. We're afraid of that saber tooth, the tiger, who's going to attack us. So we do things like we stand behind the furniture, or we stand behind that podium, or we sit for our whole presentation, or we make our body small like this, or like this, or like this, anything that's going to make us littler. This is exactly opposite of what we need to do. In order to persuade, engage our audience, connect with our audience, we need to make ourselves larger and more powerful. So no more hiding before, behind barriers. I am going to encourage you to take the stage and command the space. In fact, when I work with clients, I remove any furniture they could possibly hide behind in rehearsal. <laughs> How many people have heard of Amy Cuddy? She's one of the most famous TED speaker, speakers of all time, and she's a behavioral psychologist. And she studied power poses. And what she found is that by emulating a power pose, which would be like Superman or a gorilla or a sun salutation, or even putting your hands behind your back, that people that emulated a power pose for two minutes a day, their cortisone levels in their brain actually changed. They rose, and those people began to feel more powerful. And Amy Cuddy talks about you don't fake it till you make it. You fake it till you become it. So how do we use this in public speaking? If you are feeling nervous when you walk on stage and your gut instinct is to hide behind that podium or make yourself small, I would encourage you to fake it till you become it. Put your shoulders back, put your head up high, and it will really change the way you feel. You will become a powerful presenter just by opening up to your audience. The other technique we have is to move with conviction. Now, actors learn blocking. And blocking 
is a where we move on stage. We learn to that where we move on stage is a way we can affect our audience. Now, most public speakers spend a lot of time on what they say, a little bit of time on how they say it, and absolutely no time on where they move. If we spend some time with our talk and think about the room we're going to be presented and how we can move our bodies in that room, we have an enormous tool at our disposal to really engage with our audience. And actors have been doing this for hundreds of years. I would encourage you with your next talk to take a look at the space where you're going to be presenting and learn how you can move through that space to affect your audience. The last tool we have is eye contact. Eye contact is a really powerful tool. But again, when we get nervous, we tend to avert our eyes from our audience. Or we do this the entire time when we speak to our screens. Eyes, our eyes are the windows to our soul. It's really true. So if we can look at our audience, individuals in our audience, the whole group, areas of the room, we have an incredible tool at our disposal to make our audience feel connected to us as a speaker and to make them feel important and engaged. So we're going to try a quick exercise. Now, because we're short on time, we're only going to do this for one minute. And we are going to combine all these elements of vocal variety, actually of nonverbal communication. We are going to command the space, so that means adopt a power pose and walk with your shoulders back and your head held high, as awkward as that much might feel to you. No hands in pockets, no crossed arms. Allow yourself to do a power pose. At the same time, you are going to move with conviction. So you are going to move all through this room. Allow your body to use this whole space and make eye contact with the people you pass. No looking at the ground. Now, we're only going to do this for a minute, but I want you just to try this on for size and tell me how it feels to move around this room with power and with conviction. Go ahead. It felt great. I'm hearing greats and goods now. It might feel different than you usually enter a room, but I would encourage you from now on to enter a room, whether you're speaking or not, like this. And especially when you're speaking, your audience is watching you from the minute you enter that room. In fact, they say an audience decides that they like you within the first, are you ready for this? Two seconds that they see you. So just by adopting these powerful poses and looking at our audience, we can really connect with them and become powerful presenters. So the eye of the MOXIE method is for it factor. And what gives us it factor? In my opinion, what gives us it factor is confidence. And how do we get confidence? We get confidence by rehearsing. Now, actors learn to rehearse. It's part of our profession and part of our schooling. In fact, most plays have a six-week rehearsal process. Can you imagine going to a Broadway play and having seen actors that have not rehearsed their play? But as presenters, we rarely rehearse. Why? We feel funny. We think it's not important. We think nobody else does it. We think that if we don't do it, we can kind of procrastinate a little bit. And it's difficult. It takes time out of our busy days. But it is hands down the most important tool we have for it factor. Now let's talk about a little bit how we rehearse. So the general rule of thumb is five to seven rehearsals. Five to seven rehearsals is enough that you will know the order and flow of your talk, but you will not have memorized it word for word. There's still room for ad lib and your personality to come through, but you will not be nervous about forgetting anything. We also want to rehearse standing up and saying it aloud. No more reading your script to yourself. That is not a rehearsal. I leave a legacy of clients rehearsing to empty rooms and empty chairs. You need to get up out of your seat and rehearse it aloud. Also, I would encourage you to rehearse with the technology. Now, fear of the unknown causes a lot of speech anxiety. But if we can rehearse and eliminate some of that anxiety because we know the order, we know the flow, we know where our slides go, we've rehearsed the Q&A, we're a lot less anxious when we get up to present. There are many benefits to rehearsal as well. My favorite benefit is that when you rehearse, it's not the first time you've given the talk. It's the fifth or sixth time. Some other great reasons to rehearse, you eliminate all those mistakes in an empty room, not in front of your audience. If you're going to have a problem with your slides, if you're going to realize something is out of order, it's much better to do that by yourself than in front of an audience. So we're going to go on to the E of the MOXIE method, which is enjoy the experience. So how do we enjoy 
the experience of presenting? Well, most people that are super nervous when they present, that have incredible speech anxiety, they feel like they're going to die up there. <laughs> now, I did a little research to find out if anyone had ever died during a presentation. And I'm sorry to tell you, actually, someone did. And it was our ninth president, William Henry Harrison. He gave the longest inaugural address in the history of the United States in the rain, and he walked off stage and promptly died of pneumonia. So the good news for you is unless you're going to deliver a super long inaugural address in the rain, you're not going to die on stage. In fact, what happens when you enjoy the experience is that your audience enjoys the experience with you. When you al allow your audience to enjoy the experience with you, they become passionate just like you're passionate. So how do we make sure that we don't have crazy speech anxiety on stage? How do we make sure that that horse doesn't run away with the rider? When our horse is running away with the rider and we are not control, in control of our bodies, we do things like speak too fast, stutter, sweat profusely, move our bodies in all sorts of funky ways that we can't control. So here are my top three tips to enjoy the experience. The first tip is to rehearse. Try it, folks. It really helps lessen speech anxiety. The second tip is to breathe. Use all that good diaphragmatic breathing to center and calm yourself. And the third technique is something called labeling. And psychologists do that all the time, which is instead of saying, oh, God, I'm feeling nervous. It's such a bad emotion. I'm ashamed I feel this way. I should just get rid of it. Acknowledge it and label it. Say, gosh, I'm feeling that good old fight or flight again. I know this is a normal feeling, and I'm going to breathe through it and stretch, and I'll be OK. We can also use visualization. I was going to lead you through a visualization, but I'm out of time, so I'm just going to wrap up. We can use the tips of visualization to help us, just like athletes do, change the synapses in our brain to a positive experience instead of a negative experience. So I want to leave you with an interesting thought. And this is kind of a tough love message. The audience doesn't really care about you. They don't. They don't care if your hair, you're having a bad hair day, you've gained a couple pounds. They're there to hear your message. You are a vessel for that message. And as Steve Jobs says, if you can convey that message from your heart and with authenticity, then you have done your job. Scott Borkin, who wrote a book called Confessions of a Public Speaker, he said the audience wants three things. They want to learn something, they want to be entertained, and they want you to do a good job. I compare a good presentation to a work of art because both really deeply connect with an audience. But if we paint by numbers and play it safe, we will never make art. And we have an amazing opportunity in this day and age with YouTube and TED Talks and podcasts to spread our message and our presentations worldwide and to really affect change. Something happened to us. As children, we were very, very creative and we were fearless in our authenticity and our ability to, to connect with people. But as adults, we became afraid of ridicule and afraid of taking a chance and going out on a limb. Shirley MacLaine always says, don't be afraid to go out on a limb. It's where the fruit is. So I would encourage you to change your destiny, to go back to that childhood energy and that creativity and combine it with your newfound knowledge and skills as an adult to really affect change. Here's to changing the world, one presentation at a time. Thank you. The Moxie Institute helps you speak with Moxie and take your next talk from boring to bravo.